I'm going to now continue with some uh, very brief introduction to some of the advanced methods that are used in statistical machine translation beyond the IBM models, uh, just very briefly. So they include things like tree-to-tree -tree translation. That's, for example, work by Yamada and Knight. So the idea is that you parse uh, the sentences in one of the languages, then you do some transformations to the syntactic trees, and then you generate from that those trees to the other language. Another technique was int introduced by Och and Nye. Uh, this is a so-called phrase-based machine translation. So the idea is to recognize uh, contiguous chunks of text that form phrases and translate them as uh, units instead of word at, one word at a time. And the third method is uh, syntax-based. Uh, this is introduced by Och et al. And the idea here is to uh, use the uh, usual IBM models, but then once you produce uh, the top uh, candidate translations to perform a technique called uh, discriminative re-ranking where you compute a set of features uh, on each of the translations and then you combine them using a log linear model uh, and pick the translation that is the best and it, as, as part of this uh, log linear model you can include other features for example whether the sentence is syntactically uh, reasonable whether it's the right length and so on. And one more technique that I want to mention very briefly is uh, close restructuring by Collins et al. So the idea here is that you take some document in a language for which you have some general idea about its uh, syntactic structure, so in this case in German. And then you're going to perform a sequence of steps that make the text more and more similar to English by following the syntactic patterns of the target language. So instead of saying that perhaps adopt can, you change it to adopt that perhaps can, which matches German better. Then, so that you adopt can becomes so that you can adopt. So this is again a peculiarity of German syntax. So that can you adopt becomes so that you can adopt. This is moving the subject to the right location in the embedded clause. And then looking at things like particles. So in German, there are common phrasal verbs where uh, one of the parts of the like, preposition, like an in anrufen, moves back after the main verb. So, if, for example, if you say, rufen Sie bitte noch einmal an, uh, means call right back, please. In this case, the verb anrufen gets split into rufen and an, and as you can see, the preposition or the prefix an can be moved arbitrarily later in the sentence. So by performing those set of transformations in one of the languages, you can render that language much more similar to the target language, and then uh, you're going to avoid some of the common problems with uh, IBM models of uh, statistical machine translation and be able to get a much better uh, syntactic structure of the output. And one more thing to mention in statistical machine translation is the idea of synchronous grammars. So synchronous grammars uh, were uh, introduced in machine translation by the Kai Wu in the 90s. Uh, so the idea is to generate parse trees in parallel in two languages using different rules. So you can start, for example, from an S in both languages, and then uh, you're going to apply different rules that take into account, for example, whether the languages are subject, verb, object, or subject, object, verb, whether adjectives follow nouns, and so on. So you can have a rule in English that says NP goes to adjective noun in English and at the same time have a parallel rule NP goes to an adjective in Spanish. So now we're going to move on to evaluation of machine translation. Uh, I'm going to introduce uh, the most basic techniques that are used uh, that are, appear in uh, research papers published on machine translation. So machine translation is particularly difficult to evaluate because there's not one single answer. If you ask different human uh, translators to come up with translations of the same sentence, they're likely to come up with similar, yet uh, widely divergent translations. So human judgments are not unique. And even if you judge one human against another human, you're not going to get perfect agreement. So uh, some of the metrics that have been used in the past for evaluating translation involve asking humans to judge the translations manually. So for things like adequacy, is that an adequate translation of the original document? Grammaticality, is it a grammatical output? This kind of technique for evaluation is very expensive because if you have to compare many different systems, many different runs, and many different sentences, you would need to have thousands of humans and the humans can be actually fairly unreliable and expensive. So the focus in recent years has been on automatic methods, and specifically, uh, the most common technique these days is this technique called BLUE, 
which was uh, introduced by uh, Kishore Papineni et al. from IBM in 2002. It's a very simple technique. Uh, it is based on multiple human references and unigram, bigram, and so on overlap between them. And then uh, when the system produces its output, uh, you compare that output against all of the human judgments. Again, at the unigram, bigram, trigram, and four-gram levels. Uh, there's another technique that is also relatively often used. It's called edit cost. And this is, uh, for example, the number of edits that a human would need to perform on uh, the translation, uh, for example, by moving words around or characters around, or by counting the number of minutes that it takes to uh, revise the translation uh, to the correct translation. But I will focus mostly on blue. So here's how it works. So again, it's simple and gram precision with multiple human references. And uh, very important, it includes a brevity penalty because uh, otherwise you can come up with a translation that is very short, that will just focus on two or three of the most obvious words in the translation and get very high precision. So that's why blue inc includes a, uh, addition, an additional uh, parameter that makes it impossible to cheat that way. So blue is not an ideal metric. Uh, however, it has been shown to correlate relatively well with human assessments of automatic systems. It's not as good, however, when it's used to compare humans against automatic translations. So the bottom line about blue is that most people don't like it, but they use it anyway. And this is pretty much the acceptable, accepted standard in uh, the evaluation of machine translation systems these days. So many data sets are available, for example, from LDC, the multiple translation ch uh, Chinese and multiple translation Arabic corpora, each of which comes with a large number of uh, translations by humans and also by automatic systems that can be used for training and for evaluation of translation systems. So here's an example. You can look at it on the web in more detail, but I'm going to show you the first sentence of it only. So this is a Chinese sentence, actually a headline and then all the human references that you can uh, get from this corpus. As you can see, uh, they're not exactly the same, and even though it's a headline, they can have a relatively large uh, diversity. So now let's move on to the last topic in machine translation, very briefly, and this is the idea of decoding. So once you have built the IBM models, uh, including possibly phrase models, you have to now figure out which of the translations is most likely. So the decoding process uh, essentially is to find of all the candidate translations, the one that maximizes the probability of F given E times P of E. So we have the values of those probabilities, but now we need to find a translation that maximizes this expression. So unfortunately, even for a simple model like IBM Model 1, this is an NP-complete problem. So the longer the sentence, the more difficult it is to get the best uh, translation. So what people do instead for efficiency reasons is to use a phrase transition table, uh, specifically uh, the famous uh, Farrell system by Philip Kern, and then use um, a heuristic search, A star, like uh, combining uh, the cost of the translation up to a certain point with uh, the estimate of the translation for the rest of the sentence. And this is done at the level of phrases to make uh, things more efficient. And this is combined with beam search so that only a small set of uh, the candidates are evaluated at each step. So I'm going to conclude the section on machine translation by giving us some pointers for tools, for projects, and for uh, assignments. Uh, the first one is uh, language modeling toolkits. There are many available. I would recommend the SRI and the CMU Cambridge language modeling toolkits, which are both available for research purposes on the internet. There are some research translation systems, for example, Giza++ uh, by Franz Och and, and Moses, uh, which is available on statmt.org. And for decoders, you can download Faro also from statmt.org and from some other websites. So this concludes the section on machine translation. Uh, uh, we'll see you in the next segment.